Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, I am Dr. Rose, Assistant Professor, Department of Anatomy, Government Medical College, Trishur. In this session, we will discuss about fertilization. So before moving on to the fertilization, you should have a quick recap about gametogenesis. So have you ever thought what will happen if there is no uterus? Sometimes for some females, the uterus will be removed due to some pathological conditions. So can they become pregnant or can they give birth to their young ones? Have you ever thought about it? So there is a special term known as surrogacy. So what do you mean by surrogacy? You might have heard about surrogate mothers. In this category or in this condition, there can be fertilized eggs which are actually derived from the ovum from the mother who is not having a uterus. Then the fertilization happens outside the uterus and the fertilized egg will be implanted or transferred into a woman who is willing to bear the child. So the woman who is willing to bear the child is known as surrogate mother. So even the females who are not having uterus can give their ovum and it will be getting fertilized with the sperm of their partner and the fertilized embryo will be transformed into or transferred into another woman where the further development of the embryo happens. So such women who is giving birth to their young ones who is not genetically related to them, such mothers are known as surrogate mothers. So let's move on to the topic proper, fertilization. The site of fertilization is ampulla of the uterine tube. So this is the uterine tube, it has got mainly four parts, the interstitial part, the isthmus part, the ampulla part and the infundibular portion. So the fertilization is actually happening at the ampulla of uterine tube. The process of fertilization actually happens in three main stages. The first one is transport of gametes into the uterine tube. So we have mainly two gametes, one the sperm from the father and the other one is the mature ovum from the mother. So these two gametes should reach the ampulla of the uterine tube. Then what happens? In the ampulla of the uterine tube, these two gametes will fuse and this results in fertilization and the effects of fertilization. So these are the three main phases happening during fertilization. So the transport of gametes into the uterine tube. The sperm will be tra traveling through vagina into the ampulla of the uterine tube and the prostaglandins will help in the contraction of the uterine muscles. The oxytocin will also aid in the journey of sperm into the uterine tube. Roughly the estimated time is 2 to 7 hours to reach the destination and the number of sperms reaching the uterine tube will have to cross many barriers in order to reach the uterine tube. So the barriers will be at the cervix and also at the ostium of the uterine tube. And the oocytes are actually sucked up into the uterine tube by the contraction of the uterine tube and the epithelial lining of the uterine tube. So the oocytes will be sucked up into the uterine tube in order to reach the ampulla and the sperms will be traveling through the vagina, the cervix, the body of the uterus and it will again finally reach the ampulla of the uterine tube. This is how a sperm and an oocyte will be reaching the ampulla of the uterine tube. Now the, it's time for the fusion of gametes. The spermatozoa and the zona pellucida of the secondary oocyte. You have to remember that at the time of ovulation, we have the secondary oocyte and one polar body, the first polar body. So the spermatozoa will be fusing with the zona pellucida which is covering the secondary oocyte. In order to fuse with the zona pellucida of the secondary oocyte, the corona radiata has to be removed, then only the sperm can reach the zona pellucida. That is actually made possible 
by the hyaluronidase that is an enzyme present at the acrosome of the sperm. So, the hyaluronidase released by the acrosome cap will remove the coronal radiator and the sperm can easily penetrate and reach the zona pellucida. So, what are the three hurdles for the sperm just before penetration of the oocyte? The first one will be the coronal radiator because that will be the outermost thing which you will be seeing. Later you have the zona pellucida and the third hurdle will be the white line membrane of the secondary oocyte. So, before the fusion of gametes that is the fusion of gametes will be between the spermatozoa and the secondary oocyte. So, before that fusion the sperm has to cross three main hurdles. The outermost hurdle will be the coronal radiator and that will be actually lysed by the hyaluronidase which is present in the acrosome cap of the sperm. After that you can see the zona pellucida and only after piercing the zona pellucida the sperm will be reaching the white line membrane of the secondary oocyte. This is the white line membrane. So, the changes in the female genital tract, what are the changes happening for the sperm in the female genital tract? So, there are mainly two changes, the first one is known as capacitation. So, the capacitation ha actually happens in the uterine tube and it usually takes about 7 hours. So, during those 7 hours, what are the changes happening? There is a glycoprotein coat of plasma membrane over the sperm that is actually removed during the process of capacitation. So, that coat, the glycoprotein coat will be removed from the sperm. So, this will be just gone like this. And the next step after capacitation is known as the acrosome reaction. So, during acrosome reaction, there is hyaluronidase and acid acid phosphatase in the acrosomal cap of the sperm. So, the hyaluronidase will be acting on the corona radiator. The zona pellucida will be actually lysed by the acrosin and the white line membranes will be actually lysed by the integrin peptides. So, these are the three main chemicals acting at different levels. So, acrosome reaction is mainly the release of hyaluronidase from the acrosomal cap. The chemicals disintegrating the barriers are at three levels, three main levels, the coronal radiator by the hyaluronidase, the zona pellucida by the acrosin and the white line membrane by the integrin peptides. So, the, these are the three main barriers which the sperm has to cross in order to reach the white line membrane and to fuse with the white line membrane. Now, let us see the results of fertilization. So, what are the results of fertilization? At the time of fertilization, the female gamete will be completing its second meiotic division. So, just we will have a quick recap. At the time of birth, every female child will be having oocytes because the oogenesis happens before birth or it starts before birth. But at the time of birth, every female child will be having oocytes arrested in the prophase of first meiotic division. So, there are mainly two meiotic divisions meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. So, at the time of birth the oocytes will be arrested in the prophase of first meiotic division and this will continue until puberty and the com this first meiotic division will be completed just before ovulation and the oocyte will be entering into the next meiotic division that is the second meiotic division. Again the second meiotic division will be arrested in the metaphased phase. So, the secondary oocyte will be arrested in the metaphase of second meiotic division that is the stage at which the ovum is released from the ovary. And when will that division will be completed? That division will be completed only during fertilization. So, the female gamete completes its second meiotic division at the time of fertilization. So, that is how the, you can visualize that. The second meiotic division is completed when the sperm enters the secondary oocyte. Then you will be having a mature ovum with the second polar body released. So, the first polar body will be there in the perivite line space at the time of fertilization and after fertilization 
it will re again release one more polar body that is the second polar body. So, there will be two polar bodies in the perivital ion space. Then there will be formation of female pronucleus. So, the nucleus of the female counterpart is known as female pronucleus and the chromosome structure will be haploid 22 plus X. And there is also formation of male pronucleus that is the head of the sperm which is sucked into the secondary oocyte is now getting transformed as the male pronucleus. Again the chromosome structure of the male pronucleus is haploid. Then the cleavage division starts. So, this is how the cleavage division starts. So, we can imagine that there is haploid contribution from the father as well as from the mother. So, that after fertilization the diploid number is restored in the zygote. So, this is n the haploid number from the male, this is n another n haploid again haploid number from the female altogether the cell will be able to restore the diploid number. We can see that the cytoplasm is mainly coming from the mother because the cytoplasm of the oocyte is the cytoplasm which you have for the zygote and from the father the sperm is actually just contributing the nuclear portion. So, the cytoplasm is exclusively from the mother and you can see two polar bodies after second meiotic division. The chromosomal sex is actually decided by the father because the ovum can contribute only X chromosome. So, the Y chromosome is actually coming from the male counterpart. So, whether the child is a female or a male is decided by the male counterpart or the father. So, suppose X comes from female and another X comes from male, the resultant fetus or the embryo will be a female that is XX. And if the Y counterpart is coming from the male and you still have the X, altogether you have XY and that will be a male child. So, X bearing spermatozoa will give rise to a female child and Y bearing spermatozoa will give rise to male child. So, it is the spermatozoa or it is the father who is deciding the sex of the child because from the mother it is always X. So, from the father you can get either X or either Y. So, if the spermatozoa is bearing a Y chromosome then the result will be a male child that is XY. If this is an X chromosome from father then you will get XX and that will be a female child. Now, it is time for the cleavage division. So, the first cleavage division the chromosomes will be arranged in the equator. You can see the chromosomes arranged in the equator and what happens after that? The chromosomes will be migrating to the poles with equal proportion of the cytoplasm. This is the entire cytoplasm of the cell, the newly formed zygote. So, the chromosomes will first arrange in the middle, later the chromosomes will be pulled towards the periphery with an equal contribution of cytoplasm to each cell. The two daughter cells thus formed are known as blastomeres. So, the blastomeres are the product of cell division, the daughter cells. So, these two daughter cells are known as blastomeres and they have equal amount of cytoplasm. We have already mentioned that the fertilization is actually happening at the ampulla of the uterine tube and it occurs in three stages, the transport of gametes into the uterine tube which is followed by the fusion of gametes, the gametes being the spermatozoa from the father and the oocyte from the mother and it results in fertilization. The main aim of fertilization is to restore the diploid number in the zygote. So, that is made possible by the haploid contribution from the father as well as from the mother and the cytoplasm is exclusively from the mother. The chromosomal sex is actually determined by the father because father can give either X chromosome or Y chromosome. If Y chromosome is donated by the father then it will result in a male child and if X chromosome is coming from father it will result in a female child. 
coming to the applied aspects of fertilization, when we calculate the age of embryo, there are mainly two types. One is we can calculate it as the fertilization age. So, what do you mean by fertilization age? In fertilization age or as we calculate the fertilization age, it is actually calculated from the time of fertilization that is from the time of zygote formation till the birth of the newborn. So, this phase is actually considered as the fertilization age. And another way of calculation is menstrual age. So, menstrual age is actually calculated from the first day of the last menstrual period and up to the time when the newborn is formed. So, this is how we calculate the menstrual age. So, when we compare the menstrual age with the fertilization age, there is actually a two week disparity because usually the fertilization happens after or roughly two weeks after the menstruation. That is why the disparity happens. So, the we can say that the menstrual age is actually two weeks greater than the fertilization age. So, when we calculate the fertilization age and menstrual age, the menstrual age is usually two weeks greater than the fertilization age. Now, you might have heard about assisted reproductive technology. So, assisted reproductive technology means sometimes the couple would not be able to give birth to their young ones. There might be some fault with the sperm, there might be some fault with the ovum, there might be some fault with the reproductive organs likewise. So, what are the medical options available? One is artificial insemination and the hormonal replacement therapies. So, using hormones we can actually boost up the sperm production and the ovum production and artificial insemination is actually keeping the sperm inside the uterine tubes. There are some other techniques known as in vitro techniques in order to assist reproduction. The first one is known as in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer. So, what is in vitro fertilization? Sometimes there will be some hurdles for the sperm in order to reach the uterine tube and because of that the fertilization process will not happen in an individual. So, in that case what we do is we get the ovum from the mother and we get the sperm from the father and we fertilize it outside the uterus and once the embryo is ready, we transfer the embryo into the uterus so that it will continue to develop into a fetus. So, we have the sperm here, we have the ovum here, we have taken it out. We have taken out the sperm from the father and we have taken out the oocyte from the mother and the fertilization is actually happening outside the uterus and now we have the embryo ready outside the uterus and it is time for us to transplant or transfer the embryo into the uterus. This method is known as in vitro fertilization. Another technique used in assisted reproductive technology is known as intracytoplasmic sperm injection or we call it as ICSI intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So, what we do in this process is we actually inject the sperm into the ovum. Okay, so, we are actually injecting the sperm into the ovum or into the cytoplasm. That process is known as intracytoplasmic sperm injection and the zygote or the embryo is actually again transferred into the uterine cavity. Another method used in assisted reproductive technology is gamete intrafallopian transfer. This is known as GIFT, gamete intrafallopian transfer. As the word implies, we are now planning to transfer the gametes directly into the fallopian tube. So, we have the gamete, we have the sperms taken from the father and we are actually transplanting or transferring it into the fallopian tube into the ampulla. Then we have already taken the oocytes from the mother and again we are also transferring those oocytes into the ampulla of the uterine tube and the fertilization will happen in the ampulla of the uterine tube and it will actually go for cleavage divisions and finally it will get implanted inside the uterine cavity. The only thing we are doing is we are just taking the oocyte from the ovary and we are taking the sperm 
from the male counterpart and we are just inserting both into the uterine tube where the fertilization will happen normally. And I would like to add some more methods of contraception. Till now we discussed about fertilization and are there any methods to prevent fertilization? Yes, that is what is meant by contraceptive methods, the methods which we use in order to prevent fertilization. So there are many barrier contraceptives, barrier contraceptives are used in order to prevent the sperm from entering into the uterine cavity and fertilize with the oocyte. So that is done with the help of condom or cervical cap. We also have birth control pills and the modern pills are actually containing low dose estrogen and progesterone. What the role of these hormones are? They inhibit the release of FSH and LH and they prevent or ultimately result in the prevention of ovulation. The other different methods of contraception, the one, one more thing is injected or implanted sources of progesterone. So what is the role of injected or implanted source of progesterone? They will actually deliver a chronic anti-ovulatory dose. So when it is injected, say for a period of 2 or 3 months, they will actually deliver a continuous dose of anti-ovulatory hormone. So that will result again in an ovulation and there won't be any oocyte for fertilization. There is another preparation known as a depot preparation of medroxy progesterone acetate that is known as depot provera and this can be actually injected as an IM method. There are another methods like rods or capsules, they are known as no plant or implanon and they are actually implanted subdermally just beneath the skin and they again release a synthetic form of progesterone or progestin for a period of 1 to 5 years. So if you inject or implant the rods or capsules, no plant or implanon, you can keep it say from 1 to 5 years and they will go on producing a synthetic form of progesterone which will actually prevent the ovulation. So progesterone containing intrauterine devices are also nowadays available which will be emitting low levels of progesterone again for a period of 1 to 4 years. Another method used for contraception is sterilization that is actually considered as a permanent method. In male partners you call it as vasectomy. You are just putting a ligature over the vas difference so that the sperms from the testis won't reach due to the ejaculatory duct during ejaculation. So that process is known as vasectomy and in females you call it as ligation of the fallopian tubes. We ligate the fallopian tubes on either side that is a method of sterilization used in females. So what happens if you put a ligature in the uterine tubes, the oocytes will not be able to travel and reach the ampulla. And if it is not reaching the ampulla, even if you get the sperm in the ampulla, fertilization will not happen. So these are just the permanent methods or the surgical methods used as a method of sterilization. So in males, you call it as vasectomy and in females, you are going for a ligation, ligation of the uterine tubes. So that is all about fertilization in a nutshell. Thanks for watching.